Hey there, and welcome back to another video on Corpus Linguistics. Today we'll talk about a question that may strike you as a little strange at first. We'll ask, do most words in a corpus occur with average frequency? Now, why would I be asking that question? Well, many phenomena in the real world are organized in such a way that most events follow a central tendency, an average, if you like, and there are only very few events at the extremes. So for example, think of all the people that you know, okay, and think about how tall they are. My guess would be that most of your friends and most of the people you know are of average height, and you know a few people who are exceptionally tall, and then again another few people who are exceptionally short. Yeah? That's normal, and in fact that is what's called a normal distribution. Now let's think of words in a corpus. Do you think that there are average frequency words and only a few that occur many, many times and then another few that occur almost never? Well, here's a picture of George Kingsley Zipf, who has formulated a law that is called, well, Zipf's law. And he tells us, well, no, absolutely not. Most words in a corpus do not occur with average frequency. In fact, they follow a very different pattern that's actually quite surprising. So this is what we're going to talk about in this video. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. First, I'll talk about Zipf's law, which is a surprising regularity in the way word frequencies are structured in a corpus. I'm saying it's surprising, but at the same time, we can explain it. We can motivate it with functional factors that drive Zipfian distributions. And then in the second part of this video, we'll use AntConc and corpus data to examine Zipf's law in two different corpora. So we'll be checking whether it actually applies in the data that we have, and we'll see that, yeah, you can find it in actual corpus data. So let's go, Zipf's law. Um, as I said before, many phenomena in the real world follow what's called a normal distribution. So a normal distribution has this nice bell-shaped curve, and it means that we have very few observations with extremely low values. We have many observations with average values, and then again, we have very few observations with extremely high values. Now, normal distributions apply across very many different phenomena in the world. So for example, when you roll three dice at a time, the minimum value is 3, the maximum value is 18, but most of the time, what number are you going to get when you roll three dice? Yeah? It's going to be 10, 11, sometimes 8, yeah, sometimes 13, but it's going to be very rare that you have a 3 or an 18 or anything close to those values. Okay, so that is a normal distribution. You can try it at home. Yeah? If you have a couple hours to kill, roll three dice, take the numbers, and see if you can draw a bell curve from your results. Um, okay, something completely different, life expectancy of people in a country such as Switzerland. Yeah? So some people live for a very long time, others are not so lucky, but most of us are somewhere in between. There's a central tendency. And then I mentioned the example of height of ordinary people, people that you know or take children in the same school year. Uh, time and time again, you get a nice bell-shaped curve. Now, word frequencies are not like that. Word frequencies behave in a drastically different way. And I want to illustrate that with word frequencies in a particular corpus, namely the English Wikipedia. Okay, so here we have the 100 most frequent words in Wikipedia, and they are plotted in an XY scatter plot where the Y axis represents the frequency of the word. So the higher up it is, the more frequent the word is, and the X axis displays the frequency rank of the word. So we go from the most frequent word to the second frequent word, third, fourth, fifth, and so on and so forth, until we are um, at the hundredth word that we have in the Wikipedia. Okay, so 
Let's look at some word frequencies. The most frequent word in Wikipedia, in case you didn't know or didn't already guess this, the most frequent word is the word the. Okay, And in the Wikipedia corpus, it occurs 5 million times. So yeah, that's a very frequent word. Here we have uh, the word which, which is rank number 14. And it occurs with 360,000 different uh, tokens. Okay, so it's already much less frequent than the, but still very frequent. Now, if we look at number 100, that would be the word being. And being occurs 50,000 times in the Wikipedia corpus. Okay, why am I showing you these three frequencies? Well, here's the kicker. Um, if you multiply the rank and the word frequency, so there you would multiply 5 million for the times 1, because it is the most frequent word, you get a value 5 million. Okay, no surprise there. Now, let's check out what happens with uh, word number 14, which and its frequency. If you multiply the frequency, 360,000, by 14, its rank, you get 5 million and 40,000. Well, that could be a coincidence, right? It's, uh, that, that doesn't say us anything. Um, so let's multiply being 50,000 tokens with its rank times 100 and, oops, 5 million again. Yeah. So this is Zipf's law. The rank multiplied by the word frequency in any given corpus gives us a constant. Yeah. It changes a little bit, but still, there's a regularity, like a natural law in there. So, um, this is Zipf's law. The frequency of a word is inversely proportional to its frequency rank. Right. Um, so what this means is that some words in a corpus are used very frequently, and these would be ordinarily the grammatical words, like in English we have the, of, and, to, a, uh, in, and so on and so forth. And many, many words are used very, very rarely, and we've already talked about hapax legomena, words that occur only once in a corpus. Any given corpus will have many, many hapaxes, and only a select few that appear lots and lots of times. Okay, So in a way, this is an instance of uh, what's called the Pareto principle in other contexts. So you know, uh, the 99% of the words, they own nothing, and the 1% at the top, they own almost everything, or in a less extreme version, it's called the 80-20 principle. So 20% of the words account for 80% of the tokens in a corpus. So this is at work here. This is how word frequencies are distributed. There's another aspect of Zipf's law that uh, I want to mention, namely frequent words, they tend to be short. Okay, If you look at the, of, and, to, a, uh, in, um, they are all monosyllabic. Several of them have just one letter. And even though letters are not a perfect, reliable indicator of how long a word is, it does tell us something that we have words here that are very, very short. Okay, so frequent words are short, rare words, they tend to be longer. Yeah, think of it as the probability that you pick a hapax legomenon from a corpus at random and check how many letters are in that word. Okay, so on average, hapax legomena will be longer than the words that you find at the very top of the word frequency food chain. Right, so what does this mean? Is this just a weird coincidence? Is this something that we can explain? Well, Zipf actually uh, explained it in terms of laziness. Yeah? We as human beings, we're lazy. We try to get away with as little work as possible if we can. So this is the principle of least effort. And think about it. If we have to use a word very often, it saves time and energy if that word is very short. So just imagine every time we would have to use the determiner the, and instead of one syllable, we would have to pronounce four syllables. Yeah? It would cut a chunk of time out of our day, and that would not be very functional 
Okay, so in a way, laziness is only one aspect of the entire story. Uh, Zipfian distributions also make language and communication efficient and robust. Let me explain what I mean by that. So shorter words like to, a, uh, off, and so on and so forth, they carry a higher risk of being misheard or misunderstood. So when I say something like the secretary of the president, uh, which in fast speech may come out like the secretary of the president, um, you cannot be really sure was that an off or was that a to, was that another word, but the good news is it doesn't matter all that much because a to or an off doesn't carry a whole lot of information. Yeah, it's grammatically necessary, but you can get by without parsing the information that is contained in that little word. Um, right, so shorter words high risk of being misheard, but since they do not carry a lot of information, uh, it doesn't matter all that much. Whereas longer words carry more information and are more reliably identified. So if a word is four syllables long, there's a very good chance that my interlocutor will reliably identify that word as such. But for me, it has a higher production cost. For the hearer, it has a higher processing cost. So in a way, Word frequencies arranged in a Zipfian distribution cater to, well, a tug of war between different competing motivations in language organization. Right. So let's get to analyzing some corpus data and let's check for ourselves whether word frequencies are really Zipfian in their distributions. So um, do me a favor, open AntConc and load some corpus data in it. And if you're my student, please choose the BNCA corpus files. If you're not my student, just pick any corpus that you have lying around. Doesn't matter if it's general or special or anything. Um, just pick something of a sufficient size and you'll be fine. Right, so this is what the BNCA files look like when they're loaded into AntConc. And for the purpose of this exercise, I would like you to go to the settings, to global settings, to the tag category, and activate this little check mark here that says hide tags. Okay, so we won't be using tags in what we'll be doing today. Um, if your corpus doesn't have any tags, then you're good to go, basically. And even if you don't hide the tags, you'll be fine anyway. Right, so um, now, once you've done that, uh, go to the word list tool in AntConc. And uh, you don't need to change any of the search settings here. You can just click on Start. Make sure that the sort by bar is set to sort by frequency. Yeah? And what you should get is a display like this, where we have well something not unlike the words that we saw with the Wikipedia. So we start with the, and we have off, and to, a, uh, in, is, that, was, and so on and so forth. So these are the 1%, yeah, the words that grab all the tokens that are exceptionally greedy. And the poor bastards, yeah, the, the hapax logomena, they, they sit at the very bottom of this long list. Right, let's examine these frequencies. Um, so the, the most frequent one, we find it about 800,000 times. So if we again do our little multiplication game, we multiply the rank with the frequency, we get 1 times 793,000, and that gives us the same number, obviously. So let's do this again with off, which occurs 396 times, 1,000 times, I wanted to say. Um, so 2 times 396,400 and something gives us, whoa, that looks creepily similar to what we saw before. Uh, going down to word number seven. So the word is appears 120,000 times, seven times 121,000. Well, it's a little higher, yeah? 80, uh, 848,000 tokens, give or take. So yeah, from examining three examples, it looks like, well, this just might be Zipfian. Now, of course, we want to take a closer look. So I would ask you to save the entire output, uh, 
for for a corpus of well 12 million tokens uh, that will be a file of two megabytes or so so that's workable save the output look at the text file that Ancom gives you as output. So you notice when you save the output of a word list, we haven't done this before in this class, um, you get the number of word types, 137, well, 138,000 really, and the number of word tokens. And then you get the ranks in the first column, you get the token frequencies in the second column, and you get the words in the third column. And uh, so this lowercase i tells me that ANTCONC puts everything into lowercase to, well, um, well, when it looks at word types, it disregards case when it is looking at word types. In the settings, you can change that so that uppercase i is something else than lowercase i, but for our purposes, this is completely fine. So this is what we're going to work with. And you can copy and paste this into an Excel file and then make nice headers so that you have the ranks, the frequencies, and the words in such a way that you can take a look. Yeah? And of course, do stuff with that data. So what I want you to do as a first kind of little exercise is I want you to highlight uh, the first 20 cells of the ranks and the frequencies. Okay, so you would click into the cell and then drag everything to uh, the frequency of the word I so that you have these two uh, columns grayed out for the first 20 or so uh, rows. Right, so once you have something like that, you can actually go to the place where Excel allows you to create graphics. Yeah. And depending on your version of Excel and uh, your operate, operating system and whatnot, this will look very different. But I can assure you, uh, somewhere in Excel, you will find something that looks like this. And um, if you're exceptionally lucky, you will see a little icon that looks like a scatter plot. So coordinate system with a y-axis and an x-axis and then dots and uh, yeah just you know click on that and see uh, what happens let Excel do its magic um, and what you should get is something like this uh, which looks well again not unlike the Wikipedia word frequency and rank graph that we saw earlier in this video yeah and um, if we want to Look at these dots here. So the first dot that is the <clears throat> occurs around 800,000 times. So that looks spot on. Then we have off down here, 400,000. Um, and then we have and and two, which are equal or just about equal in frequencies. And then it goes down. And uh, well, we have this long tail of words with decreasing, softly, gently decreasing frequencies, which is the hallmark of a Zipfian distribution. Now, um, let's do this more thoroughly, okay? We want to do this not only for 20 words, but rather for all the words that we have. If I remember correctly, we have 137,000 types, yeah? so this table goes down a long way. Um, so do me a favor, highlight columns A and B, and just do the same thing, okay? So find the icon where you can make a scatter plot and click on that, and if everything goes to plan, you should get that looks a little something like this, okay? Which at first glance doesn't look very nice or interpretable at all, okay? We still see the point for the, the point for off and for and and so on and so forth, and then we see this long tail, yeah, but we can hardly uh, make out the differences there because there are so many ranks, okay? And also the scale of the frequencies is so, um, well, most words are really down here, yeah, in the um, single digits or double digits. So this is uh, not an ideal way of looking at it. And some of you will <laughs> be impatient for me to say this, but we need to change the axis to logarithmic scales. So 
Excel lets you do this, so you have to do a little bit of fiddling. What I had to do was a right click into the Y axis and the X axis. Yeah, so here you see how I did that. And then uh, in my fancy French Excel, there is a format de l'axe. And uh, if I click on that, I can actually select an option, échelle logarithmique, logarithmique. Voilà, there we are. And, um, well, that already changes the appearance of the graph just a little bit. And we do the same for the x-axis, in case you hadn't done that before. Okay, so again, right-click, and we select this logarithmic axis option, and boom, yeah, we have a straight line, more or less. So, you know, not perfectly straight at the edges, that's normal. Not normally distributed, but that's normal for a Zipfian distribution. So as long as you get a straight line, more or less, that means that, yeah, we have found a Zipfian distribution in our corpus data. So uh, that's cool. Um, just for fun, or not for fun, but for professional reasons, I don't like graphs that don't have labels on their axes, and neither should you. Okay, so when we see a graph with numbers on the axes, we have a damn right to know what these numbers mean. And uh, that has to be done with axis labels. So um, in my version of Excel, there is, uh, well, <clears throat> a tab that says Création de Graphique. And uh, then we have certain options here. And one of them is Titre des Axes, uh, Axes Titles. And your Excel has something similar. If you can't find it, um, well, here's my, here's my advice. Try for five minutes for yourself. If that doesn't work, uh, Google the problem and see if someone else has uh, tried to explain this on the web. Yeah. And if everything else doesn't work and you're my student, write me an email and we'll figure something out. Okay. But um, I'm hopeful that you will figure out how to put access labels on your Excel graph. And this is not only something that's useful for corpus linguistics, that's a life skill. Okay. So whether it is your, you know, job or whether you have a presentation at some kind of committee that you're working with, you know, this is good stuff. Okay, so enough of that. Um, so here I entered labels for rank on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis, and this is something that I would be reasonably happy with. Okay, so great, we found Zipfian distributions of words in the BNCA files. And um, of course you might say, well, it's just one corpus. How can we be sure that this is really a general law and not just a coincidence of something that happens in Wikipedia and the BNCA files? Well, there's lots of research out there showing that, well, it's not only certain texts of English, but Zip's law is actually something that applies across many, many, in fact, all languages that we have in the world, at least those that have been looked at. Okay, so here's a graph or part of a graph from a paper by uh, Steve Piantadosi, um, where he looked at data from languages as different as French, Czech, Turkish, Polish, Basque, Maori, Talk Pigeon, German, English, and a bunch of others. And you see the distribution of, well, rank on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis, and we get the same kind of power law distribution, it's called, yeah? So the, the, the same straight line if we log log the two axes. And uh, yeah, well, that is an insight that is a regularity of language that reflects the two factors that I mentioned earlier, human laziness, and the adaptation of human language for robust and efficient communication. Okay, now um, we've seen that Zipf's law applies in the real world. Let's check 
if it also applies in the Harry Potter universe because, well, Harry Potter's universe is magical. We know that things might be different. So let's all go back to Hogwarts and see what we can find out there. So first of all, clear all the tools and files that you have in AntConc right now and then load the Potter corpus into AntConc. Um, if you don't have the corpus, the, the Potter corpus, well, there's a video of mine that you can check out, and below that video there's a link. I'll also try to remember to put a link below uh, this video so that you can access the Potter corpus and do this exercise for yourself. Right, so um, load the Potter corpus into AntConc, navigate to the folder that contains it, and uh, then if all has gone according to plan, your AntConc interface should look like this with the seven Potter novels. Um, this is not a tagged corpus, so we don't have to hide tags or anything. We can just use it like that. Yeah? And we can go to the wordless tool again. And uh, well, don't need to change anything here. We just click start. And this should give us a word list that looks a little bit like this the and to, well, no surprises up to that point, he, yeah, of a Harry, yeah, sure. So there are differences across corpora, and we might wonder, well, this is sort of a story that has one main character and a set of other characters that do stuff with him. Might that mess with the Zipfian distribution of words in the corpus? Well, we can check that out. So do me a favor, save the word list uh, and um, well, open the txt file that Ancong generates for you and then copy the data into a new Excel sheet. So that should look something like this, where you have the and to he of a Harry, along with the frequencies, of course. So the 51,000 and 27,000 to 26,000 and Harry well, just above 18,000 tokens. And uh, then you do the same thing as before. And this time, of course, you don't have to do any of the clicking. All you do is call Akio Zipf, and then the graphic appears magically in your Excel file. Oh, I've tried that a couple of times. It works every time. It's, it's magical. Um, yeah, but more importantly, mm, it's a straight line. Yeah, so yeah, we got a Zipfian distribution on the basis of a corpus that is not just a general big corpus, but something more specialized. So yeah, so this tells us something. There's one more thing that I wanted to show you. Um, and for that, we need to look at the Harry Potter uh, word frequency list a little bit more. And uh, there's one thing that I want us to try out, namely, I want us to check whether also the characters in the Harry Potter novels follow a Zipfian distribution. In other words, um, so Harry is ranked number one, okay, no doubt about that. Then um, we have uh, Ron um, further down, so word-wise he's ranked 25, but um, character-wise he's ranked number two. Yeah, the second most important character, Hermione. Yeah, sorry to all Hermione fans. I'm a Hermione fan. Um, rank 30 at uh, character rank number three. You guessed it. Number four is Dumbledore. Any guesses for number five? Number six? I was wrong about that. So um, I'll let you figure that out. So I scrolled through that list ranking all the characters that I could identify. I took last names as characters. I was not sure about that first, but I thought, oh, what the heck, let's rank them. And uh, so here's my result of the first 37 characters. If you have lots of time on your hands, you know, you can do this until you have identified every last character. There must be more than 37. So, but I got Harry, Ron, Hermione, Dumbledore, Hagrid, Snape, Weasley, Malfoy, Voldemort, Potter, Sir so there we have a last name, obviously, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, and uh, now let's check. Is there a Zipfian distribution in these characters as well? So I would again encourage you to 
highlight the frequencies and the ranks and create a graph, uh, set the axes to logarithmic scales and then see if you get a straight line and I can do a little spoiler here, the line is straight, yeah? So Harry, Ron, Hermione, Dumbledore, Hagrid, Snape, Weasley, and after that it kind of gets blurry, yeah? But um, yeah, so this is sort of a phenomenon that sits between something that would be linguistic and something that would be more, more cultural or, well, uh, guided by different principles. So the way you tell a story, obviously it has to do something with communication, but uh, again, well, this is where Ziff's law really shades off into aspects of the real world that are not language. And I started this video by pointing out that many phenomena in the real world actually follow a normal distribution pattern. Well, there are also lots of phenomena that follow a Ziffian distribution. And if you'd like to find out what these are, here's a very reasonable man looking kind of crazy, uh, Michael Vsauce. Yeah? If you don't know that channel, do yourself a favor, spend a couple of weeks watching his videos. So um, Michael has a great video on Zipf, on Zipf's law and phenomena that have Zipfian distributions, including language. So um, it has typing monkeys. So it has that going for it. And I suggest, I encourage you to check it out. Link in the description below. That's it for today. I hope you have a good week and I'll see you all next time. Bye.